Well, last week we studied the church of Sardis. We're going through, in case you're visiting, we're going through the seven churches of Revelation. And we studied Sardis. It was a church that had compromised with the culture in order to get along and to be at peace with the culture. They didn't want to make waves. They didn't take any strong stands. And in doing so, they were essentially denying the exclusivity of Jesus Christ. You know, by not taking strong stands, and in today's culture, it would be like that sort of coexist thing where, you know, all paths lead to heaven. No, they don't. All paths maybe lead to religion, but all paths don't lead to God or lead to heaven. And whenever you begin to stand for the exclusivity of our faith, you get some pushback. And it's the same thing when it comes to standing for the things that the Bible says, because in our culture, nobody wants to be told, you know, what to do or what's right or what's wrong. And so, you know, the easy path is to just kind of step back and say, okay, you can believe what you believe. This is what we believe and, and move on. And that's kind of what the Church of Sardis did. You know, they were very popular in their culture. They, they had a great reputation in the city. They were movers and shakers, so to speak. But Jesus himself found almost nothing good to say about them. He was not pleased with them. And today we're essentially going to uh, see the opposite in this church of Philadelphia. See, from outward appearances, if you were to judge this church, Philadelphia seems to be small and, and weak, and, and it faces extreme opposition from the culture. So... In contrast to the church of Sardis, Jesus looks at this little weak, struggling church and says, I approve of them. And so that's what we're going to look at today. Revelation chapter 3, verses 7 through 13. The Bible says, Jesus says, write to the angel of the church in Philadelphia, the Holy One, the True One, the one who has the key of David, who opens and no one will close and closes and no one Open says this, I know your works because you have limited strength and have kept my word and have not denied my name. Look, I've placed before you an open door that nobody is able to close. Take note, says Jesus, I will make those from the synagogue of Satan who claim to be Jews and are not but are lying. Note this, I will make them come and bow at your feet. And they will know that I have loved you. Because you have kept my command to endure, I will also keep you from the hour of testing that is going to come over the whole earth. To test those who live on the earth. Jesus says, I am coming quickly. Hold on to what you have so that no one takes your crown. The victor, I will make him a pillar in the sanctuary of my God. And he will never go out again. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God. The new Jerusalem which comes down out of heaven from my God in my new name. Anyone who has ears should listen what the Holy Spirit is saying to the church. So some background here on the Church of Philadelphia. One of the original intentions of this city was for them to be a, a place where the Greek culture was introduced to the surrounding areas. So this is called Hellenism. Way back under Alexander the Great in 300 BC, Alexander the Great wanted the entire region to become Hellenized. He wanted them to take on the Greek culture, the Greek language, and the Greek thought, and that sort of a thing. And in a sense, it was helpful. That's when Jesus Christ came 300 years later. The entire region basically had a common language, and they kind of had a common culture. Some of it good, some of it, some of it bad. And so this was essentially Philadelphia in Asia Minor was essentially a missionary outpost to try to Hellenize the pagans, or I should say the heathen in that, in that region. They were wanting to introduce the Greek culture and so, so forth to the outlying areas. So right away, we can see that there is this secular pagan influence in this culture that's ultimately always going to be at odds with those who truly live for Christ. So if you try to live for Christ in this culture, there's going to be some headbutting. You follow what I'm saying? They're, they're, they're trying to infiltrate the Greek culture, you know, the paganism and all that stuff into the culture. And if you stand for Christ, obviously you oppose that. Now from the start, just so that I believe the key to interpreting this passage of scripture is to assume from the text that just like Smyrna, they are being persecuted by the local Jews. This seems abundantly clear from the text that what is ultimately happening here is the local Jewish population is opposing them. Revelation chapter 2, verses 8 through 9. 
we looked at Smyrna. Write to the angel of the church of Smyrna, the first and last, the one who was dead and come to life. Says this, I know your affliction and poverty, yet you are rich. I know the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. The church of Philadelphia faced the same synagogue of Satan. Just like we saw in Smyrna, they were being opposed by the local Jews. Here in Philadelphia, they are being opposed by the local Jews. This was what it said in John chapter 8, verses 39 through 44. The Bible says this. This is Jesus speaking. John 8, 39 through 44. Do we have it? Let me know if it comes up. Go ahead and read it. The one who sent me is with me. He has not... Uh, is it 39? Got it? Okay. Okay, so Jesus is in a dispute with the Jews. And they said, Our father is Abraham, they replied. If you were Abraham's children, Jesus told them, you would do what Abraham did. But now you're trying to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. Abraham did not do this. You're doing what your father does. We weren't born of sexual immorality. They said, We have one father, God. Jesus said to them, If God were your father, and he's speaking to these Jews, you would love me because I came from God and I'm here. <coughs> For I didn't come on my own, but he sent me. Why don't you understand what I say? Because you cannot listen to my word. You are from your father the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, and has not stood in the truth. Because there is no truth in him, whenever he tells a lie, he speaks from his own nature. Because he is a liar and the father of lies. Now if you can turn to Romans chapter 2, verses 28-29. through This is what the Bible says. A person is not a Jew who is one outwardly. And true circumcision is not something visible in the flesh. On the contrary, a person is a Jew who is inwardly, and circumcision is of the heart by the Spirit, not the letter. His praise is not from men, but from God. So the original converts to Christianity were mostly Jews, okay? And most of the early church were Jewish converts. It was very Jewish, okay? But... There were also many Jews who rejected the message. Many Jews rejected Jesus Christ. They rejected the plan of God. And in doing so, what happened is they took on a wrong spirit towards those who did. So it's like an infighting of a family. You have Jews who accepted Jesus Christ and Jews who did not accept Jesus Christ. And those who did not accept Jesus Christ often took it out in very negative ways towards those who did. In the households and social settings in which this happened, to convert to Christianity could mean that you were kicked out of the synagogue and rejected by your own family. And so what this would mean is there would be strong, negative social and economic consequences. Now last week we read in Matthew chapter 10, in verses 32 through 39, and this is what Jesus said. He said this, Therefore, everyone who acknowledges me before men, I will acknowledge him before my Father in heaven. Whoever denies me before men, I will also deny him before my Father in heaven. Don't assume I came to bring peace on the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. I want us to read the scripture with this knowledge, this understanding, okay? He's saying, don't deny me. Don't deny me for your own comfort. Don't deny me in order to avoid persecution. And he's saying, it's possible and it's going to happen particularly amongst these Jewish households, that if you accept me, your family is going to reject me. So again, he's not saying you have to hate your family in order to be a follower of Jesus Christ. He's saying you have to love me more than you love your family. He's saying, I came to turn a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies will be members of his own household. This is what this is talking about. The infighting between those who accept Jesus and those who don't, and those who don't accept Jesus, rejecting those who have. He said, the person who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. The person who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever doesn't take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Anyone finding his life will lose it, and anyone losing his life because of me will find it. All of this... Is, is, is expressing what the language of this text seems to be referring to. So yes, they have opposition from the culture, but it's mainly opposition from their brothers and sisters in the Jewish community. So let's now that we have the context and understanding of this letter, we're going to go back through it. 
Write to the angel of the church in Philadelphia, verse 7. He says, the Holy One, the True One, the one who has the key of David, who opens and no one will close, and closes and no one who op- no one and who closes and no one opens, says. Again, as always, Jesus addresses himself in a way that is appropriate to this specific church. So, number one, Jesus is the Holy One. From Isaiah 40, verse 25. We see this is a name for the God of Israel. So Jesus is saying, I am coming to you as part of the triune Godhead. And then he says, I am the true one. This this is in contrast to the false leaders of the synagogue. He's saying to them, these guys are false representatives. I am a true representative of God. And then it says here, this is interesting. He says, I have the key of David. This is a reference to Isaiah 22, verses 15 through 23. I want us to listen to this. The Lord God of hosts says, go to Shebna, that steward who is in charge in the palace, and say to him, what are you doing here? Who authorized you to carve out a tomb for yourself here? Carving your tomb on the height and cutting a crypt for yourself out of rock. So he was a chef, and he was a steward over the house of, of God, particularly over the palace, but he was using things for his own benefit and own gain. He says, look, you strong man. The Lord is about to shake you violently. He will take hold of you, wind you up into a ball, and sling you into a wide land. That's God talking. There you will die, and there your glorious chariots will be, a disgrace to the house of your Lord. I will remove you from your office. You will be ousted from your position. On that day, I will call for my servant Eliakim, son of Hilkiah, and I will clothe him with your robe and tie your sash around him, and I will put your authority into his hand, and he will be like a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. I will place the key to the house of David on his shoulder. What he opens, no one can close, and what he closes, no one can open. Now, historically, these keys, they might be keys to open the gates of the city, so they might actually be, we call it a key, like a big bar or lever, like on your shoulder. It's not like you have these massive gate to the city and a little teeny key out of your pocket will unlock it. There's levers and things there, so that's, that's, the, that's the shoulder thing. But we're understanding context here. Shebna was over the household, and he was a false steward. He was a bad steward. He was replaced with a good steward, Eliakim. And the authority of the house was transferred from Shebna to him. That's what the key represented. So the steward oversaw the whole house and the whole palace. He had the keys to everything. This picture is what Jesus Christ is talking about right now. He's using what these Jews would understand to unlock their minds, okay? So, like Shebna, he's saying the rulers of this synagogue there in Philadelphia have been replaced. They are not the true authority over the house of 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 God. He's saying, I am, Jesus is saying, I am the true authority of the house of God. I have the key of David. I have the keys to unlock entrance into the kingdom. I have authority over the household of God. So what Jesus is telling him, he is saying, these false stewards, these synagogue leaders who have locked you out of the synagogue, these false leaders, they, they can lock you out of the synagogue, but they cannot keep you from entering the true household of God. You follow the the, the, the context here. Jesus is looking at them saying, I've opened a door to you and nobody can shut the door that I have opened to you. Verse 8 in our text, he goes on to say, I know your works because you have limited strength and have kept my word and have not denied my name. Look, I have placed before you an open door that no man is able to close. See, these are, this, this church of Philadelphia is not a prominent church. It's not a prosperous church. It is a very weak church. And this is, and, and, and I'm not near closing yet, but I'm just going to say, if you're feeling weak today, if you're feeling like there's not much to me or to my life today, I want you to embrace the church of Philadelphia. They, they don't have a lot to show for themselves. There's not a big showy church. They're more like a little storefront church just trying to eke out a work for the Lord. But they have been faithful. They have kept God's word. And they have not denied Jesus Christ. 
And because of that, Jesus says, I place before you an open door, Kathy, that nobody can shut. What does this mean? Again, the Jewish leaders in charge of the synagogue, these are in that culture. See, we get into the Jewishness of it. In that culture, these were the supposed caretakers of the kingdom of God. These were the supposed stewards of the kingdom of God. The leaders of the synagogue were the stewards of the, of the kingdom of God. These guys had shut the door. You're no longer allowed in the synagogue because you have accepted Jesus Christ. We are going to cut you off from the synagogue. We're going to cut you off from fellowship within the Jewish community here in Philadelphia. But Jesus is saying to them, I am the real overseer of the house of God. And because of your faithfulness, the door to the true kingdom of God will always be open to you. Now, I just want us, if you grab anything, I want us to grab this. Because what, what's been mentioned today, because of our faithfulness to Jesus Christ, there may come persecution from the culture here in the United States of America. And this concept, I just want us to grab this concept. I'm going to keep preaching, but if you just grab this, you've got, you got it. Okay? And it's this. It's, this is very important to people that are being persecuted then and also now. Okay? Because being faithful to Jesus may result in us being cut off from a lot of things. Okay? You follow me? Being faithful to Jesus may cost you your job. Being faithful to Jesus may cost you relationships. Being faithful to Jesus may keep you from being able to get rich and all these things. But Jesus promises... In spite of all that, the door to the kingdom of God will always be open to you. You follow that? That is more precious than anything else on the face of this earth. Yes. This culture can shut off every other door. But the only door that matters is the door to the kingdom of heaven. Amen. And it's worth whatever we have to go through. Shut that door. Go ahead and shut that door. Go ahead and cut me off there. Go ahead and do this. Do that. Do that. But because of my faithfulness to Jesus and these doors being closed, Jesus says, I have a door open for you that no man can shut. And that is the comfort that we receive. That is the comfort. We always have access to the king and his kingdom because we are faithful to Jesus Christ. So that's, that's the... Mm, the thing that we take out of this message today. Now, some commentators will go a different direction, and they believe this open door represents a door to evangelism or other opportunities. And there's a verse, 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 9. The Bible says this, A wide door for effective ministry is open for me, yet many oppose me. Um, and that's that, that, what they're basically saying there is, uh, you know, the culture may shut you out of a lot of things, but... When the culture shuts you out, I'll create new opportunities. And that is absolutely true in a secondary sense. If the world shuts you off over here, what does Jesus say? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. So a secondary application of this scripture is, wherever the devil shuts something down, God will open up a door over here, whether it's ministry or opportunity or provision. Devil, oh, go ahead and shut that door because God's going to kick another door wide open for me. That's the promise that we have here. But this is primarily the kingdom. It's about the kingdom. Whatever we need, the king provides it out of his kingdom resources. Amen. Verse 9, the Bible says this. And just as Jesus talking, and it'll go faster here. But he says, take note. I will make those from the synagogue of Satan who claim to be Jews and are not that are lying. Note this. I will make them come and bow at your feet, and they will know that I have loved you. <coughs> Whatever this means, because we don't have the historical or the biblical context to understand everything, it means vindication. It means ultimately that these Jews are going to recognize that Jesus Christ loves them and they are part of the covenant community of believers. Do you follow that? He's saying, he's saying don't worry, you're going to be recognized. Okay, and so he's, he's just basically saying, don't worry about it, I'll, I'll vindicate you. And then verse 10, the Bible says this. In verse 10 it says, Because you have kept my command to endure, I will also keep you from the hour of testing that is going to come over the whole world to test those who live on the earth. 
And again, we do not have the historical context to understand what this scripture means. Now, what's happened is a lot of people have applied this scripture to a pre-trib understanding. You follow what I'm saying? They have said, it says right here, I will keep you from the hour of testing that is going to come over the whole world to test those who live on the earth. And so, we understand all about that. I'm not going to get into pre-trib, post-trib, and all that, that kind of stuff. But they have used this to try to say this is a pre-trib rapture scripture. But I want to, I want to ask you a question on, on this. Okay. If Jesus is speaking to the church of Philadelphia, and he's saying, listen guys, I want you to take heart. I know you're being persecuted, but guess what the encouragement is? In 2,000 years, people in the United States of America are going to escape persecution. Does that comfort you? No. That wouldn't comfort me. Hey, in 2,000 years, the other believers that are going to be living are going to escape persecution while you're going through it. They're going to be raptured out of it. That, see, does that make logical sense? It doesn't make logical sense. So I personally believe we don't have the historical background. I just, you've got to kind of sometimes have to apply Holy Spirit logic to something. I personally believe that during their time, they were spared from something that the surrounding communities were not spared from. That's totally <coughs> logical, and it aligns with Scripture. Because the emperors were always, you know, doing something, some, you know, to, to persecute different peoples or that local leader might have gotten ticked off in certain communities and done certain things. And I believe that Jesus, I know what Jesus is saying is, you're weak. You can't handle any more. You're like to the point of breaking. And I'm not going to let anybody push you any further. That's what he's saying in this scripture. Now verse 11, it says this, I am coming quickly. Hold on to what you have so that no one takes your crown. He's saying, stay steady. He says this to us. Hold on. Don't give in and, and, and forfeit. You've held on so long. You've been faithful. Don't get weak and let go and forfeit some of the blessings that you could have if you had just stay strong. Try to soothe and just hold on. Amen. Just hold, hold on. Now, verses 12 through 13, and this is, this is really cool. It says, the victor, I will make him a pillar in the sanctuary of my God. He will never go out again. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God and my new name. Anyone who has ears should listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. Now, I do a lot of studying, so it's like, you know, these things don't just pop into your mind. But I want to, you know, in studying, I, I discovered this. 1 Kings chapter 7, verse 21. It says, he set up the pillars at the portico of the sanctuary. And he set up the right pillar and named it Joachim or Jacob. And he set up the left pillar and named it Boaz. These are the pillars. He's, you, these are Jews he's talking to, right? And so he's pulling their history, right? He's saying stuff that they will understand. He's saying, I will make you like a pillar in the house of of God. Yaquin or Jaquin means he will establish. Also, they've been kicked out. Okay, they've been these are they've been kicked out of the synagogue representative of the temple. And then Boaz means in him is strength. They are weak. Jesus is speaking to them in a language that they will understand. I also read that these pillars can be called shoulders. And see, it's on the, on the shoulders of the high priest that the names of the sons of Israel were written or right. Exodus 28, 9-12. Take two onyx stones and engrave on them the names of Israel's sons. Six of their names on the first stone and the remaining six names on the second stone in the order of their birth. Engrave the two stones with the names of Israel's sons as a gem cutter and raise a seal. Mount them, surrounded with gold filigree settings. Fasten both stones on the shoulder pieces of the ephod as memorial stones to the Israelites. Aaron will carry their names on his two shoulders before the Lord as, as a reminder. So I want us to catch this understanding, okay? 
He's speaking to people who have been cast out of the synagogue. He's speaking to people who have had their names cut off from the register of the synagogue. So they can't come in the synagogue anymore. And that registry that registered all of the local Jews, your name's been scratched off of this registry. And you've been made weak because you cannot participate in the meetings of the synagogue or the social environment. It is to these persecuted believers that Jesus says this. In this language, he's saying, I have a permanent place for you in my temple. You're not going to be kicked out of my temple. As a matter of fact, you have a permanent place. That's what a pillar represents, a place of permanence. He's essentially saying, I will establish you, Yaqim. You follow that? He's saying, you're going to be established in my temple. And I will move you from a place of weakness to a place of strength, Boaz. He's speaking to them. You're never going to be kicked out of my temple. As a matter of fact, you're going to be permanently placed in my temple. As a matter of fact, you're going to be positioned in a position of strength in me. You have been made weak by them, but you're going to be strong in me. This is what Jesus is saying. And he says, oh, you've been ripped off the registry. You've been, you, your name has been stripped out of the temple. I'm going to one-up it. I'll, I'm, not, it, I'm going to write my name on you. I'm going to give you a new name. I'm going to write my name on you. And I'm going to write the name of the city that you belong to on you. And I'm even going to give you my new name. Stamp, stamp, stamp. I'm going to place my name all over you. You're going to be permanently identified with me. So what? You were kicked out of that little synagogue. You're going to have my name written all over you. And I am going to complete your identity in me. Amen. See, in the most absolute sense, God is saying, I have, they've rejected you, I have accepted you. These are breathtakingly comforting words. He's looking at them and he's saying, you've been beleaguered, you've been persecuted, you're weak, but hold on. Because the blessings of belonging to me far outweigh any benefits that the world could give to you. It, the blessings of belonging to me far outweigh any of the struggles that you're going to have to face. He, this whole book of Revelation is written to encourage us to be overcomers, to remain faithful to Jesus no matter what. And time and time again, he's trying to unveil, reveal the blessings of remaining faithful to him rather than giving in to this world. Revelation was not meant to scare us. It was meant to encourage us Amen. to hold on no matter what. That's the message. And I got a couple little things and then we're done. The first is, so that's the message. But I just want to take a few notes here. The church. <laughs> okay. Praise God. I'm still going to finish. <laughs> The churches with no positive qualities that Jesus recognized are Sardis and Laodicea. We're going to get to Laodicea in a, in a couple, two, three weeks. These are the churches that look the most impressive to the world and to everybody else. They're the ones that Jesus said, not so much. The two churches that didn't have any negative consequences that Jesus said nothing negative about that he really loved, Smyrna and Philadelphia, they were the most harassed. They were the weakest. The one he loved the most had the most problems. The ones that Jesus loved the most had the most struggles. The ones that appeared the strongest were the weakest. And the ones that were, appeared the weakest were the strongest. So don't receive preaching, worldly philosophies, or anything else that contradicts this. It says in order to be pleasing to God or in order to have God's favor, you must have all of this in your life. It's, it's really a mixed bag. We don't understand all of it. I mean, God blessed Abraham and David 
and, and these were powerful men and mighty men and wealthy men. And, 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 and then you have Daniel in the lion's den. It's, it's, a mix, it's a mixed bag. We really, you know, things are not always as they appear. And you just got to be very, 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 very careful on how you judge another brother or another church. Because you don't know what they're going through and you don't know what God's doing in their lives. But I'm just telling you this. I'll, I'll stop here without going negative over here. I'll stop here and just say the people that God loved the most were the ones having the most problems. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not saying that weakness is a virtue in that sense because if it's because of our own you know, sinfulness and slothfulness and laziness that we're going through struggles, that's not a virtue. But if no matter what's going on in your life, You've been faithful to Jesus Christ and you're facing some stuff, then just know that Jesus loves you and he's going to walk with you and he's going to carry you through that. And it's not a sign that God is mad at you. We don't understand this whole kingdom thing, but we can read his word and gain comfort from it. Amen. Greater the afflictions of the saints, the greater are the blessings that are going to come to us on the other side. Amen. 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 I'll just stop right there. I just, it's just, I just don't want us, you know, if you're having struggles today, God loves you. He has not abandoned you. It's not because he's weak. It's because he's working out for us an eternal way of glory that's far beyond our, our what, what we can imagine. So maybe you, I'm glad, Pastor John, I'm going to use, tap into you in a second, your, the prophecy that you received. Maybe you feel a little like those in the Church of Philadelphia. You can identify with being weak. You can, be, you can identify with being rejected. You can identify with doors that were shut in your life. You know, Paul had a discomforting thorn in the flesh because he had these great revelations. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 through 10. This is what the Bible says. Especially because of the extraordinary revelations, therefore... So that I would not exalt myself, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to torment me, so that I would not exalt myself. Concerning this, I pleaded with the Lord three times to take it away from me. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Therefore, I will gladly boast all the more about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may reside in me. So because of Christ, I am pleased in weaknesses, in insults and catastrophes, and persecution and pressures. For when I am weak, then I am strong. This was the church of Philadelphia. They were weak, but in God's power, they were kept and made strong. See, to a person like this, and let's just don't make it Philadelphia, it's us. If you're going through it today, God says, because of your faithfulness to me. Doors of opportunity may be shut all around you, but do not fear, because the door to my kingdom will always be open to you. See, God wants us relying on Him. He wants us focusing on Him and His kingdom. And, and you know what? For most of us, that's just plain easier when we're not naturally strong. It's all, uh, uh, many times it's a lot easier to focus on Jesus when things aren't going good. Can I have an amen? amen? Whenever there's plenty of money in the bank, and whenever our health is off the chart, and where everything is going good, a lot of times it's not as easy to be turning and seeking God as it is when things are not going good. So maybe, in the mercies of God, throughout our life, God has caused some doors to be closed so that it would be a lot easier to see and choose the right doors, the doors of His kingdom. You know, the truth of the matter is, whatever happened in your past or my past to cause us to be in the kingdom of God right now was worth it. Whatever struggles, whatever things happen, and you go back through your life and say, oh, if this just would have happened, if that just would have happened, if this just would have happened, if that just would have happened. But, you know, we were not to play that game. 
number one. But number two, what if, what if God allowed those things to bring you to the place right now where you are fully immersed in his kingdom? Because that's really the only thing that matters. You know, this, is, this may be a little bit of what Paul felt. The Holy Spirit was helping him write Philippians chapter 3. Philippians 3, verses 7 through 14. I think kind of, this kind of captures the spirit of what we're talking about. The Bible says this. Paul, uh, Paul was talking. He said, everything that was a gain to me, I have considered to be a loss because of Christ. More than that, I also consider everything to be a loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Because of him, I have suffered the loss of all things. But he says, I consider them filth so that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Not having a righteousness of my own from the law, but one that is through faith in Christ. The righteousness from God based on faith. My goal is to know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death, assuming I will somehow reach the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already reached the goal, or am fully mature, but I make every effort to take hold of it, because I have also been taken hold of by Jesus Christ. If you are weak, and you are struggling as you pursue Jesus Christ, it's not necessarily a bad If you're here today and you're weak and you're struggling, I have a scripture for you. Can you put up 2 Corinthians chapter nine, chapter 12, verse 9, and just leave it up? The Bible says, my grace is sufficient for you because power is perfected in weakness. Leave that scripture up, because what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask Pastor John to pray this over us today. If you're weak and you're struggling, I'm not spouting off New Age philosophy. I'm not giving you my opinion. I'm giving you the, the milk and the meat of the Word of God. And his Word does not go in return void, but accomplishes what it was sent forth to accomplish. And today... We are going, in all of our weaknesses, in all of our trials, in all of our struggles, we're going to receive the encouragement of Jesus Christ, and we're going to lift our hands in a moment, and we're going to receive the grace of God that we need where we are weak to be made strong. Now, Pastor John was talking about his weariness to someone, how just weary and worn out he was, and I'm going to let him maybe... Uh, build on this a little bit as he prepares to pray for us but somebody came back with him with a prophetic word that said my power is not limited by your weariness so you can feel weak you can feel broken you can feel defeated but Jesus Christ is not weak he is not broken he is not defeated and all that is doing is open the door to the kingdom to receive the grace of Jesus Christ to be operating in our life amen, amen. so let's stand Pastor John it's been a long day, so we're not going to try to push us much further. I just want us to receive this grace that's here for us today. Throughout this service, I have sensed your sensitivity to the Lord, and I've just so appreciated it. Uh, the Lord did give me a word which I think may be relevant for some of you. I am not limited by your weariness. And whatever you're facing, God's not limited yet. All things are possible to God and through God. And so I've contemplated this message, Pastor, and thought about it, prayed about it. Uh, I have uh, an invitation for you to participate with the Lord in something here. The Church of Philadelphia kept the words of Jesus, right? The Church of Philadelphia did not deny his name, right? The Church of Philadelphia persevered, right? And in the face of all of that, Jesus proclaimed open doors. 
an open door, which pastors talked about. But I'd, I'd like to ask you to consider participating with me in this closing moments of our service. If you can agree with this, Jesus, I commit to keep your word by your grace. Can we say it? Jesus, I commit to keep your word by your grace. Jesus, I commit not to deny you by your grace. Jesus, I commit not to deny you by your grace. Jesus, I commit to persevere by your grace. Jesus, I commit to persevere by your grace. Now, in the name of Jesus, standing in for him to bless you, I decree open doors in Jesus' name. Open doors. Go through in the grace and wisdom of God and possess what God is opening for you. In Jesus' name, receive the grace of God to do it. Is there an amen? Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Well, Father, I thank you for this service. It's been full. It's been your kingdom. The Lord, release us under the hedge of protection that you provide. Let your hand of blessing remain on us the rest of this day. We thank you that you give us the privilege to participate with you in what you're doing. And we give you the ultimate praise in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you.